So since we've, we're in a house of learning, I wanted to start off with a photograph of an exam hall. Now, I'm not sure about you, but even the, the looking at that picture brings back a sense of dread <laughs> and foreboding and going into the hall and sitting down and waiting for that turning open in the paper. But my question to you this morning is, do you remember your first exam? Think back. Do you remember your first exam? It's a bit of a trick question because no matter how much you scrunch up your face and try and go back, very few of us will remember our first exam because we look like that. Now, I probably wasn't that cute. But our first exam happens and it's when we're one minute old and when we're five minutes old. It's a two paper exam. And it was invented and it's called the Abcar test. Introduced by this lady who you think should be your granny. Anybody know about Virginia Abcar? She's a unsung hero of Western civilization. The first lady professor in Columbia Medical School. And she invented this test in 1953. And since 1953, wherever Western medicine has practiced, the doctors have looked at the, the neonate, the newly born, and carried out this profoundly simple test that you and I could carry out. Scored twice, because prior to 1953, when a baby was born, they counted limbs, toes, and if they were all there, and the answer came to 24, swaddled and put in the nursery, and many underlying trends were missed. Because Virginia Abcar realized that the most dangerous part of life is, is at birth, and likewise, it struck me when I heard this story, the most dangerous part of a newborn company's life is at the beginning, the early months and the early years. So what about a health check for a newborn business? So I've been a little bit cheeky and invented my own Abgar test for new businesses. I kind of forced the letters in, but work with me on this one. <laughs> Aspiration, people, goals, activity, and return. So, the newly born that I want to investigate is, a, new, uh, is a, a newly born very close to me, and it's my own company. I co-founded with Heather Reynolds and Brian Barry. We provide customer contact solutions. Uh, uh, said we started trading in May 2011 with just nine people, and by the middle of next year, uh, we'll be employing 950. We have 700 people now. We're 100% export. We're winning small little contracts in South Africa, so things are starting to happen to us. And we're supported by Enterprise Ireland. And uh, for those starting up a great organization, they might be difficult to engage with, but keep going, be persistent and tenacious, a great organization. And our anchor client, where we have a couple of other smaller ones, is that we managed to land a blue chip organization very early, and it's great, and it's the driving power behind our growth. It's EE, they're the, first, the largest UK mobile provider and they were the first to launch 4G in UK and Ireland. They operate the EE Orange and T-Mobile brands. Large company, but they're loving our work and they're coming back to buy more. So, the Abcar test for Eshtek, aspiration. I love this quote. Make no little plans. They have no magic to stir men's blood and probably will, them, will not themselves be realized by Daniel Burnham. Anybody recognize the city? Chicago. Perfect. Who'd be an architect in Chicago? Because the buildings are superb, and everyone's into how the buildings look. And this aspiration struck us because when we started in May 2011 with just nine people in a corner of an office that was a company had just failed in, we had dark days. Pardon me, just. And we had this brand new floor above us. And in the dark days, I'd say to Brian and Heather there, I said, come on, we'll have a look. And we visualize this floor full of people, and I said, he's crazy again, you know what I mean? But I think aspiration and vision, and vision is one of the most powerful fuels any new startup can get. It's the drive that'll get you through all the, the knockbacks. So we took that picture in November 2011, and just four months later, almost in the same spot, we have a living, breathing company employing people and doing business. I think one of the most important things for companies to find this heroic cause. No matter what you're doing, no matter how humdrum or mundane you think the thing might be, find a heroic cause. Because when we get our young people of Waterford and Wexford in to talk to us, 
we're not talking to them about the phones. Of course, we'll train them in all the good aspects of customer care. We're giving them that heroic cause about how many people have been unemployed. This is your chance to get back on your feet for you, your families, the community in the Southeast region to get back on your feet. And we're saying we're, we're a very competitive company. We're saying, you know, you're not just competing here. We are now, in effect, competing globally. And we're trying to give them that sense of something bigger. And whatever your business is in, get and instill that sense of something bigger. Because once you can get that vision going, people will come behind you. The next P in the app car is the people. And Jeff mentioned some of these things. These are the cogs of your business, your partners, your network, and your employees. And I think even in small companies, something that's often forgotten about, maybe even more so in technology startups, is the culture. And it will strangle you if you get it wrong, if you forget about it. Building that culture with good values instilled from the very beginning, and we're still working on it, is vitally important because the wrong culture, even in a, an otherwise good organization, can kill you. Your network, Jeff alluded to it, it's key. But you need, to, you need to work your network and dig your well before you're thirsty. Because events like today are perfect. You might, you might be coming here to see the speakers, but look to your left and your right. They may be a new supplier or a new customer. Network, network, network. Because again, edge tech story is business through the network suppliers through the network. And finally, the partners. Uh, there's three of us have started up the business. I don't think uh, we could have done it individually. And partners are great. I mean, you can bring individual skills together. The knowledge and trust, of course, must be there. Leadership, at, at certain stages, different, different people with different characteristics will start to take the lead. And that's a good thing. We operate a little bit of a triumvirate, and you know that can stop somebody going off in the wrong direction. So your choice of partners is a vital one. And also to have a sense of humor and to make sure that it's fun as well. You can drive on through the difficult times with that little bit of sense of humor. And it's all about relationship. Uh, I'm not, you know, ours is a, is a telecommunication support, so it's a little bit techy. But in the smaller, maybe more specific tech startups, it's still all about relationships primarily. I would say probably even more important than the actual thing that you're working on. Goals, a little bit of Lewis Carroll quote there. If you don't know where you're going, then any road will get there. I think it's vital because there's too many distractions. So we have strategic goals and operational goals. And in our business, operational goals, everything is measured. We measure, 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 we analyze and act. It's kind of a mantra. But the strategic goals are probably more important because there's so many distractions. You really need to know what business you're in and you really need to know what business you're not in because opportunities will arise. And if you don't have that original vision, you're going to get distracted. Activity. Now, this is a little bit of audience participation. If something is worth doing, it's worth doing. Not in this game. Badly to begin with. <laughs> Badly to begin with. Now, that's not a license to go in there and do your worst work. But what it's saying is that if you, if you want to get into this, get moving. Get in the game. It's worth just to get the momentum behind you and start doing things. You go, oh, that wasn't really good, but we'll get it better the next time. Get in the game. Because unless your name is Carlos Tevis, you know, you can't get too, into too much trouble on the bench. That's a football joke that's probably a year too old, but you know. <laughs> it's nice and warm and safe, and there's no pressure on the bench. And for a lot of time when we've been talking about setting up a business and this and that and the other, there's nothing like just doing it. Get in the game, and I encourage you all to get involved in that. And finally, the return. Now, we've been very fortunate through the funding there's no VC money. We've self-funded as we've gone on. But we've been profitable from day one. And, and you know, we, we manage our cash. A little cliche there, but it's cliche because it's truer and truer as we go on. Revenue is vanity. You know, margin is sanity and cash is king. Our, our challenge is now are managing the cash and getting cash positive. And every bit of growth, just when you're getting cash positive, every bit of growth or a new contract, suddenly you're, you're kicked back again. But we, we, we accept that as part of the growth cycle. And you know, you're there for return, for, the, for Jeff's point. The investors will want to see that return. And therefore, it's very important to us that, you know, despite all of the other good things that we're doing, 
we are a very much a bottom line type of company and we have to eke out return and protect our margins and be careful about how we grow the business to ensure that the return is always there. So I suppose my message is, in terms of my experience over the last two and a half years, is that the obvious things are the product, the customers. These, you know, you'd expect them to look after that, but there are other underlying factors, just as Virginia Abcar realized that the health of a baby is not just about the obvious. There are underlying factors that if you get right, you can spot problems and fix problems and, and have a, an overall you know, good, healthy organization and, and business. If you look at other things other than the obvious. And just one final thought, and uh, this is really to those who are thinking about or have just got into the, the, the uh, setting up your own business. And I have to read it. But 20 years from now, you'll be more disappointed by the things that you didn't do, by the ones that you did. And it's about sailing away from that safe harbor. And for us, we'd worked in organizations for a long time, worked for, always worked for big organizations. And I suppose, and it's well covered in the press, uh, the, the company is, uh, is, is, is arisen from talks, talks, closure in Waterford with the, the, uh, the redundancy of uh, you know, 600, 700 people over the course of two years. So we were kind of forced into it. We had ideas that we could have done it before ourselves, but it's still the big step when it's forced on you and you say, well, what are we going to do now? It's still quite a nervous thing to say, well, actually, we're going to do it ourselves and we're going to set up our own business. I hope that's been of some use and encouragement to you in terms of, you know, maybe you've got your own little lab car test that you want to apply to your own business, but there are under underlying factors that are key in the success of your organization to make sure it gets past those few difficult months and years. That's me, and thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>